this is VLSI data conversion circuits lecture 56. In the last class we were looking at a current steering pair and what happens to this tail current waveform when the drive waveforms change state. And we saw that as the drive waveforms make a transition, the node V x assuming everything was done sufficiently slowly would do something like this. All right. Now, In practice of course, there will be a whole lot of parasitic capacitance at the source coupled node. Okay. So, to a first estimate, what do you think is the current flowing through C p? Pardon? To first approximation, the current flowing through C p is nothing but I C p which is nothing but C p times d V x by d t and why do I say it is a first approximation? will change. So, please note that why I call this an approximation is because the V x that we have drawn here was drawn based on the fact that there is no capacitance and that or the current through the capacitance is negligible. Right. So, this is purely from a DC picture and once we draw this we say that hey actually the current flowing through the capacitor is C p times d V x by d t, right. But the V x that we are using is not the true V x that will be there at the source couple node. Okay. So, in reality the total current that is flowing uh, or the sum of the two source currents of the transistors must be equal to this is I 1 and say this is I 2. I 1 plus I 2 must be equal to I plus C p times d V x by or plus I C p which is approximately equal to C p times d V x by d t. Is clear? Now, during 
this period the first half what is the direction of the current through icp or uh, the, uh, the current through cp pardon is it in the direction of uh, uh, capital i or uh, opposite to the direction of capital i so this is during this time this icp is in this direction and in the other half the time it is in this direction correct okay so what can you say about i1 as a function of time ideally it must be when vl is low what must be i1 let me redraw the diagram here for you when v l is low i 1 will be 0, when v 1 is high the current will be it will eventually reach i okay. and if things were going very slowly the current will do what the d c equations predict which is this right assuming no parasitic capacitances Does it make sense? Okay. Now, as we discussed uh, earlier, right, the fact that the rise time and fall time, uh, you know, when these, uh, for example. these uh, transitions okay, as we saw can cause nonlinearities in the in the uh, in the DAC. So, I mean the basic idea would be to try and make sure that these transitions happen as quickly as possible, which basically means that the voltage at V x will take a rapid dip and get back to I mean if you want to reduce the size of the transition and make it as thin as possible that means that the voltage at V x will also become a thinner sliver which means that the slope of the voltage across those across the parasitic capacitance will increase causing the reactive current to increase. Now, during the second half what happens to this uh, uh, this current the, the reactive part of the capacitor current is it flowing in the same direction as I or this is the parasitic this voltage is doing this. So, after the dip and when it is coming back the current through the parasitic capacitance do you think it is in the same direction as I or, uh, or is in the opposite direction same direction and during the second half where is most of the current flowing 
which transistor is it flowing? ICP will be some current which does this correct this is this is icp this is the waveform correct so what do you think the current in the i1 will be as a function of time when you kind of consider the parasitic Pardon? In the second half at least, what do you think the current should be like? It will be more than what is predicted by the DC equations. So, it does this and then you will see that this must be added to to the the, uh, the i so what you will see is that the current will kind of peak like this and do this because during the first half the current is in the opposite direction and there will also be some overlap capacitances between the clock waveform and the output node and so on. So, for the first part of the transition period, you will find that the current actually is negative, this is only a, a reactive component and then this transistor starts to turn on okay. and as it turns on assuming the waveform is like this, the current in the second half will be higher than the DC tail current because of the reactive component of the current in the tail capacitor, which will cause an increase in the current and of course, this waveform settles to its steady state value, at which point the current will come back to So, as you can see, there is a within quotes glitch in the output current waveform okay. and this glitch is there whenever there is a transition alright. So, do you think this glitch is a linear phenomenon or a non-linear phenomenon? I just told me it depends only on the transition. So, if it is a linear phenomenon, it must depend on the
okay so let me so if you look at look at just uh, the waveform of i1 let's say the waveform was doing this right and then when, uh, if there was a transition of 1 to 0 it would do this okay so this is 0 1 0 now because of the strange stuff happening at the close coupled node whenever there is a transition you will have a glitch correct so it does not depend it does not seem to depend on i mean so this stuff happens whether or not it's a, it's a rising edge or a falling edge okay so this glitch is basically a nonlinear phenomenon okay so because strange things happen only when whenever there is a transition it does not depend on the sign of the transition which is why this uh, effect is uh, a nonlinear one and therefore the key point i mean of course you can go and sit and analyze this uh, uh, very carefully but as designers we are interested in avoiding the problem rather than trying and understanding in detail what happens to i mean how it manifests as uh, nonlinearity and so on so the basic idea must be to try and keep and the problem is the glitch so to avoid the problem you avoid the glitch as much as possible and the glitch is coming because of reactive currents through the through the capacitances parasitic capacitances at the switching node so to cut a long story short what you want to do is to keep the total parasitic capacitance at node as small as possible and how do you think you can keep this uh, net parasitic as small as possible pardon decrease so this parasitic capacitance cp is coming because of what all transistors it is coming because of these transistors and the cas code correct so here the are the source drain parasitics of sorry the drain bulk parasitic of let's say this is m1 m2 m3 and m4 cdb of m2 plus cgd of m2 all right please note that this is a bias node v cas code v bias all right then there is one of the transistors either m3 or m4 is off correct which means that the cgs of that transistor is i mean you have uh, c source to bulk of m3 or m4 plus some cgs of m3 or m4 plus whatever routing capacitance there is in this wire all 
does it make sense? All right. Now, what happens to instead of to reduce the glitch, you want to keep total CP as small as possible. So, what do you think you can do? Keep M3, M4, and M2 as small as possible, which means that what can you say about their lengths? If you want them to support the same current, but you want them to be as small as possible and have the same, I mean, have as small a uh, headroom as possible because you want to maximize the headroom for the. Which of these transistors do you think should have the largest overdrive voltage? Of all the transistors here, M1 through 4. Which transistor would you would you allocate the highest overdrive? <coughs> huh? Which of these transistors would have the largest? overdrive and why which one would have the largest gate overdrive voltage Why? M, which one? M two. Why is the W by L low? No, there are four transistors here M1 through M4, right. So, which of these transistors will you allocate the largest gate overdrive to and why? We discussed this in the last class. So, you want to keep whatever headroom you have to stack up these three transistors, the largest amount must be allocated to M1 because that directly influences the, the matching. Is that clear or it is not clear? Yes. All right. Now, after that, okay, you these transistors must carry a current, must be sized so as to be able to carry the current, tail current I, right? But you want them to be as small as possible, so as to minimize the capacitance at the source coupled node CP. Yes. Now that can be accomplished by choosing right the uh, for that given uh, let us say you decide to split up this available uh, headroom after you remove 
the one allocated to M1, the rest of it you split among two transistors. Now, if you want to make both the transistors as small as possible, for that headroom, you will choose you know whatever W by L is required, correct, to support that current. Now, once W by L is required is chosen, you have to choose the W and the L, is not it. So, the question is what L will you choose? Pardon? So, you will choose the smallest length possible in the technology. All right. Okay. Well, uh, let's come to that. Now, if, if these transistors are made very small, right? It means that the threshold voltages can also change by a large amount, but do you think uh, mismatch in M2 is an issue? Let us say you had two cascoded current sources, all right. So, clearly the mismatch here is a problem as we saw before and we figured out you know how you can calculate the sizes to get a certain, uh, certain delta i by i. Now, the question I am asking you is what happens to the mismatch in these transistors? If their thresholds are different, let us assume that the lower transistors are matched, but these thresholds are different from each other what do you think will be the mismatch in the current. So, let us say this threshold is off from this by delta V t, what will be this current is i, this will be i smaller or larger, smaller and what will be delta i. Pardon? It will be approximately be delta V t by R naught which transistor? The lower transistor, right. Why? Because this behaves like a source follower. So, the source voltage will be lower by approximately delta V t. So, the delta I will be delta V t by R naught, okay. So, the question now is, is mismatch in the, in the cascode devices important? Pardon? Yeah, so the, if the same mismatch was there in the lower transistors, the, the mismatch in the currents would have been delta V t times G m of the lower devices. Now, it is only delta V t by R O and since G M R O is a much much is a very very large number hopefully much much larger than 1 okay, which will particularly be true because for matching you would have chosen a large length I mean right for the same W 
times a I mean for the same w by l you want to you you, you want to have a large w times l and that was accomplished by taking w and l and multiplying both by some some factor to achieve the given a v I mean uh, sigma v t correct which means that the GMR of the lower devices will be large which means in turn that the effect of mismatch in the cascode devices is small. So, we do not really have to worry about the fact that we are using a, a device with a very small w times l right. The motivation for choosing a small transistor on the top would be to make sure that the capacitance at the top at the source coupled node would be as small as possible. The same thing also holds for the current switch transistors you would also choose them to be small or as small as possible. The mismatch if mismatch in the cascode devices is not an issue mismatch in the current source transistor I mean the current switch transistors should be also not an issue as far as DC current is concerned simply because it will get divided down by some GMRO the whole square. All right. And to reduce the glitch or the distortion or dynamic distortion in the DAC, you want to make sure that the interconnect between the transistors, the switch transistors and the cascode devices is you know as short as possible. Does this make sense? Now, let us see what happens I mean the last time around we assumed that the two currents uh, the two drive waveforms crossed each other exactly in the in the middle. Let us say by some quirk of fate the drive waveforms uh, did one of the drive waveforms was skewed so that it did this. Let me So, we will say let us say this is V L and uh, this is V R. What do you think will happen to V X now? at the intersection point what is happening why no so at the intersection point what happens now I mean if V L so if the waveforms are like this, so that momentarily both the transistors 
V L the one corresponding to the left and the right okay if both of them are off at the same time what happens this current source has no option but to simply discharge whatever charge there is on C p and please note that this is all happening for a very very short interval of time. So, there is no danger of C p going hopefully all the way to ground so, understand if this voltage goes too low the current source itself will get get crushed and get into the triode region right. Assuming that such eventualities do not arise what will happen is that this capacitance C p will now lose an awful lot of charge ok. So, when one of the transistors gets back into action what will happen this voltage V x is at a level which is much lower than what it would conventionally have been right which means that the initial glitch in the current which is must be proportional to V g s minus V t the whole square uh, right and so this voltage the source voltage is now much lower than what it would have been right if it had if the drive waveform had arrived on time ok and uh, therefore, the initial glitch current will be higher or lower than otherwise it will be much higher than otherwise you understand. So, if let me call this m 1 and m 2 if m 1 and m 2 are off simultaneously. leads to large glitches which means poor dynamic linearity right. Please note that this nonlinear phenomenon due to the glitches occurs regardless of whether the tail current sources are matched or not matched all the tail current sources being matched will only mean that the static linearity which is the steady state settled value of the current as a function of digital code is is good ok. However, these parasitic capacitances contribute to nonlinearity of the entire waveform and not just the settled value ok and as we discussed the last time around there are many uh, instances or applications where the linearity of the entire waveform is of interest and not just the settled value ok. So, the key point is to try and avoid large voltage swings at the source coupled node ok. So, to achieve good dynamic linearity you want to make sure that the voltage excursions at V x are as small as possible one particular point to avoid is to keep to make m 1 and m 2 both simultaneously off which is easily possible if the timing waveforms are skewed you understand. So, uh, in fact one common thing to do is to move this cross point such that neither of these transistors is off simultaneously you understand. So, for good dynamic nonlinearity keep m 1 and m 2 on rather than during the transition So, that 
the voltage swing at V x is as small as possible. Now, putting all this together, if you want to design a DAC, first choose sigma of delta i by i based on d n l slash i n l specs and segmentation strategy. as we saw the last time around to achieve a given sigma d n l and sigma i n l you have two knobs to play with one is the segmentation percentage segmentation and the other one is the uh, sigma delta i by i and we saw that for a given sigma delta i by i there is an optimum segmentation right for minimum area okay once you do that you choose the current cell design i mean you basically know the the size you need for the tail current transistor right and uh, the cascode device and the switch devices are chosen to be as small as possible while being able to support the current okay so choose cast code and switch transistors as small as possible. The next thing is to try and lay the whole thing out. Okay, so, now the, the question is uh, let us say I have a 10 bit converter with 6 plus 4 segmentation. 6 thermometer bits and 4 binary bits. Okay. Now, this means that I will have 63 current sources for the uh, thermometer DAC and you know, I have a 4 bit binary DAC. All right. So, I have a 6 bit thermometer DAC that is uh, uh, you know there are any number of ways in which you can place 63 current sources. Okay. So, one thing is to say I am going to place current source 1 here physically, current source 2 here and so on until I have current source 63 here. Right. Each one of these has got tail current source and switch and so on. You understand? And then I will join up all these and go to V O P and V O L. So, what do you think is the disadvantage with this? Of 
course, the DAC looks very unwieldy simply because it is thin and and long. You understand? You put, I mean, imagine you have bricks and you put them all like this; they will run from. I mean, uh, they are very thin and uh, skinny kind of layout, right? And it turns out that in practice, on an IC, it's not just that there is random mismatch, there is also some systematic gradient of process parameters. So, for example, the oxide thickness may change slowly along this direction, which means that whatever current mirror you use to set the bias voltage okay, assumes that the oxide thickness is what there is on the left side of the array. right? So, if the oxide thickness varies slowly as you keep going from the left to the right, you will find that there is I mean there is systematic mismatch or gradient because of of this small change in the oxide thickness or for instance the mobility across the as you go across the die. It may also turn out the threshold voltage varies in a systematic way across the die which will which is uh, which will also happen with oxide thickness changes slowly. You understand? Another thing is that if you connect all these the sources of all these transistors together, there will be some small drop along that source interconnect, right? Because the bias voltage you are applying is between these two voltages, but the interconnect has got some small resistance, and as you keep going from the left to the right, the drop across the interconnect resistance keeps increasing. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, so, to prevent, I mean, one way of preventing you know gradients from accumulating is to I mean, fundamentally, what is one way of accumulating? I mean, if you are if you lay out current sources from left to right in an array, they will go across this entire table. Okay, and let's say this the grade there's a gradient which slowly is happening from this end to the other end. If you want to avoid the gradient, what will you do? You would ideally like to put all the current sources as close to each other as possible, so that any variation across the die does not cause problems. Okay. Of course, physically it is not possible to put all the current sources at the same place. You like try and minimize the area occupied by these current sources. I mean, uh, in other words, you want to make them all as close to each other as possible. Right? One way of doing that is to put them as a square array rather than as a linear array. Okay? And uh, it turns out that that also simplifies the decoding logic a little bit. So, for example, we can lay them out as a square array of current sources. So, in our example, it was a 6 bit array, all right. So, if you break it up as an arrangement of 3 by 3, then you can lay them out in rows and columns, 8 rows by 8 columns. Okay. So, you have what is called a column decoder, and a 3 bit row decoder. This is very similar to how you would address a memory cell, okay. And locally, this is a 3 to 8 decoder, and this is also a 3 to 8 decoder, all 
okay and locally you can when a particular cell needs to be selected both its row and column address must be one okay so you can appropriately generate logic signals which will make sure that the right number of cells are select okay and this way the extent occupied by these current sources the physical extent occupied by these current sources is much smaller than what you would it would be when you laid them out linearly okay now you can do a better job by breaking this up for example into four sub quadrants right so let us say instead of having current sources of value i here a given current sources is broken up into four sub current sources of i by 4 each okay so now you can make one way of making it more uniform is to say i'll make four arrays of i by 4 current sources each and then arrange them i mean each of these sub arrays will be much smaller than this big square array now if i do that let us you know, abstract it out like this okay a certain current source i1 has got a representation here a representation here a representation here and say a representation there right and this is and then i'll choose i2 here say here here and here okay all right so one thing you can see is that all these i mean this is i1 by 4 if you like okay and four of them connect in parallel this is i2 by 4 and so on so what happens is that all of these are chosen to have the same centroid therefore linear and i mean if you have linear gradients it will get simply averaged out you understand and so now you have to only worry about the mismatch you know between there will apart from linear gradients there will also be quadratic gradients and so on so but the average separation between current sources is now a lot smaller than it was if you had a single big array okay so uh, this is also a fairly common thing to do there is also uh, ways of uh, i mean placing these current sources in such a way that uh, you get better spectral properties by you know uh, placing the uh, i mean at this point it is not clear whether you must arrange these current sources as 1 2 number 1 2 all the way to 8 9 10 and so on there is any number of ways of arranging these things correct with appropriate change in the logic you will be able to address them uh, properly so it turns out that there are techniques of choosing arranging these current sources properly in ways that kind of randomize the errors due to gradients not mismatch i mean random mismatch there is nothing you can do about but if there are systematic gradients by choosing these locations randomly right you can uh, uh, do things uh, the final thing that i wish to add is that the the delay in these decoders will be data dependent it is combinational logic so depending on the sequence in prior history the delays may change correct if you use these uh, these uh, signals directly to go and address the cells the times at which uh, the these these cells which will depend on prior history in some nonlinear fashion and cause distortion at uh, high frequencies right so what so what is the standard solution to avoid these random delays you retime these signals at the at the current cell so 
at the switch level there is some switch driver logic which looks at the row decoder the column decoder and the master clock and make sure that adjusts the cross point properly and syncs it up with the clock. So, this way the drive waveforms of all the current sources are synced to the clock and therefore, random variations in delay due to data dependent delays in the combinational logic also become no longer a problem. Okay. So, this is what a basic current cell will look like. We are, I mean, actually, the the average separation between uh, current sources is going down by uh, this thing, correct? So, on the average, the separation between I one uh, these two current sources is much smaller than what they would be if you had made a bigger. That's all, correct? So, uh, so this. Uh, so, I guess I'll have to stop here. Uh, as far as current steering DAX are concerned, this is uh, you know it just touches the surface of uh, current steering DAX. Hopefully, with the uh, with this background, you should be able to read up the papers and and understand stuff um, in a lot more uh, detailed fashion. Um, so, in the next class, uh, we will take a look at I mean the last topic that I wish to uh, cover, namely. So far, we've seen that. The, I mean, if for example, a current steering DAC like this was used in uh, as the feedback DAC in a delta sigma converter, there is going to be mismatch between these elements, and as you have seen in your assignments, mismatch in these elements will cause. I mean, ideally, for a multi-bit modulator, the spectrum, the PSD must look like this. Okay, with, uh, and this must be the input signal and this is the shaped quantization noise if the DAC was perfectly linear. If the DAC is not linear what happens as you have seen in your assignments there is the low frequency part and you know, the noise flow rises and there is also distortion when the input is a sine wave. Okay. So, in the next class we will see the intuition why this happens and what we can do to prevent this. Okay. Uh, so, we will continue on Monday.